Happy New Year, Poggians! Now, I've been watching the social media feeds and that means I know there's lots of GMs out there preparing this year's campaigns. So, I hope you have great games and lots of fun and it's all fantastic. Now, some of you have been drawing maps and dividing them into countries and in those countries you're putting different kings and queens. Well, I've got a few tips here that I hope will help your games. Now, I think the primary driver for doing that is because you want some intrigue and some wars and battles and so on. And here's the thing, I think having different countries is probably the wrong way to go about it. Because if you want those things, then you also probably want your players to care about at least one of those nations. And to do that, you've really got to adventure some time in one of those countries to get to know the people and the places. And the moment you have multiple nations on a map, your players travel from one to the other, they're in a different area, and suddenly everything they learnt about the world is now no longer important. All they're going to care about is the world that they're, or the country they've gone into, and that other one was what they were doing when they were lower level. Look, if you want your players to care about the people and the places, you've got to keep them in a place long enough to get to know it. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have travel. Yes, you absolutely should. But if you can keep them within the same culture for a while, they'll learn that culture. So how do you do court intrigue and still have multiple players and battles and wars? Well, luckily, history actually gives us the answer. You see, the whole idea of the nation-state is actually relatively modern. It began in the 14th century. And in fact, there are still languages in the modern world today that have no concept of the nation-state. You can't even convey this idea verbally to another person. There are other ways to have battles. In the 15th century, we still had private battles being fought within Britain, the country that I live in. The last one in 1470 was the Battle of Nibley Green, where the Viscount Lyle, arguing over the ownership rights to Berkeley Castle, had a little private war with Baron Berkeley. Now, this particular battle isn't really that interesting. The Viscount was outnumbered, he had 300 men to the Baron's 1,000, and he charged those 300 men forward, during the charge, he was shot in the face with an arrow and stabbed to death by archers and his little army routed and the Baron was victorious. What's more interesting to me when you, in terms of inspiration for campaigns is that Baron Berkeley had, I believe it was a brother, who was disowned by the Berkeley family because uh, they'd married beneath their station. So. Uh, and forgive me if I get some details wrong here, it might not have been a brother, but um, the, this family member had been disowned. And in order to try and win favour back with the family, he offered some men for the battle. It was one of many reasons why the Baron of Berkeley outnumbered the Viscount so heavily, with a three to one advantage. But the Baron of Berkeley had many allies, so uh, this this offer of men was kind of just ignored and his brother stayed disowned, having married for love. But it's not the only battle in British history where lords fought private wars with each other. And in fact, sometimes those wars could influence greater wars that were for control of the crown itself. A few years before Nibley Green was the Wars of the Roses. Now, near the start of the Wars of the Roses, and yes, I'm saying that right, it is plural, this was a period of British history that uh, wars were fought over generations trying to decide should we have a Lancastrian king or should we have a Yorkist king? And uh, it was basically Star Wars mixed with Game of Thrones, a family dispute tore the country apart into which side of the family should be in the top spot. 
In the Battle of Northampton, uh, which 1448, I want to say, uh, hopefully. <laughs> anyway, um, the battle was decided not really by the two armies meeting. Uh, and I'll, I'll hopefully one day I'll get the opportunity to do a, a full video on this one because I find it quite interesting for a number of reasons. But the bit I'm interested in today was uh, Lord Grey, Lord Edmund Grey of... Well, he was from Bedford, but that wasn't his title. Um, trying to think of... Uh, is it Ruthpole or something? Anyway, he had a claim in... Caster Castle. That's right, I almost said Caster, Casterly Rock then. <laughs> no, not the Lannisters. No, um, he had a claim over Caster Castle. I'm still trying to work out exactly what his claim was and how he was involved in the dispute over Caster Castle. Uh, there was a later, another private battle fought at Caster Castle. Um, the story of that one is quite interesting. There was a, a knight who fought in the Hundred Years' War. Uh, what's his name? I want to say Fairfax. Anyway, he fought in the Hundred Years' War. The important thing was that he came from common stock, became a hero in the war, became a knight, and on his retirement he built a castle for himself to live in. When he died, he bequeathed his lands and his castle to the Paston family. This was a family that was also of common stock. This angered John Mowbray, the, uh, I want to say, Earl of Norfolk. It might have been a Duke. I think Duke of Norfolk, John Mowbray. Uh, who said, well, this is a castle in Norfolk by rights that should be mine by the right of my birth. I am the Duke of Norfolk. And the two sides disagreed. The Duke of Norfolk, John Mowbray, might have been an earl. I think he was a duke. Pretty sure he was a duke. And the Paston family, who were of common stock. Now, much later, there was a battle that decided this, ultimately in favour of John Mowbray, before Nibley Green, but after Battle of Northampton. In the Battle of Northampton, Edmund Grey had a stake in the ownership of this castle. He favoured one side or the other. I haven't yet worked out which, so if anybody in the comments knows which side he favoured, then I would love to hear your research on it. Um, now, Edmund Grey was defending the then king. In fact, I'm going to put a little bit pause in here because I can't remember the king's name and I want to look it up. King Henry VI, a Lancastrian king. And in his ranks on his, I believe his left flank was Edmund Grey. Lord Edmund Grey, uh, who was from Bedford but had an entirely different title. Now, Richard Neville was the Earl of Warwick and he was supporting the Yorkist claim to the throne. They'd returned from a uh, defeat a year or so earlier, I think it was in St Albans, anyway. They'd arrived in Dover, they'd marched as far as Northampton when they happenstanced upon the king, by which time they had 10,000 men with them. Not enough. I mean, they might have won, but now it was raining, the king had artillery, which they didn't, his men were better equipped, the king had a proper professional army, whereas the Earl of Warwick was commanding an army uh, with his uncle and... Ah, doesn't matter. The point is, they were concerned that they might lose the battle. And in fact, they waited three days for it to rain in order for the, you know, to, to advance on the king's men without being hammered to death by artillery because the artillery couldn't fire in the rain and they knew the weather was likely to turn. And those three days gave the Earl of Warwick, Richard Neville, the chance to communicate with Lord Edmund Grey. And as a result of those communications, Lord Edmund Grey was promised support in his claim over Caister Castle if he just came over to the Yorkist side, the Yorkists would support his claim on the castle. And whichever side of that claim Edmund Grey was on, which I'm not yet sure. <laughs> so, 
Richard Neville, the Earl of Warwick, advanced on Lord Grey's men who put down their pikes, stood aside and allowed the Yorkists to march through. The king was captured and a year later the Lancastrians would no longer be on the throne as a direct result of that battle. Private property disputes and private wars were symptomatic of the feudal system. Nation states that we have today, they're really just the feudal system plus plus, a turbocharged version of feudalism. So we can do everything we need all within one country, provided we put enough lords and barons and earls and viscounts in and enough properties with competing claims for them to get angry with each other and maybe do some side switching and that's where your intrigue comes from. It's not from this country has all the food and this one has the big military and they support each other and uh, this one um, this, this, this one's angry over that one because they want uh, this raw resource and uh, no it's not as absolute as that. It's oftentimes just aristocratic pretentiousness. I often wonder just what made a middle-aged person agree to fight for their lord. But of course I don't think fighting was necessarily optional for those people. They pretty much had to do it. But what drove that system? I always been curious about that. Like how does a lord, how, how did the Richard Neville arrive in Dover with 2,000 men and get to Northampton with 10,000 men? There was obviously enough support amongst the the, the Kentish people to deliver another 8,000 men. Well, actually, come to think of it, there probably was because there was that guy before the Wars of the Roses started that marched on London and said, I am somebody, ah, uh, doesn't matter. The point is, the point is, private battles are all you need and you don't need countries. But if you do, are you sure you want all of them to have a king and a queen? You see, there are many forms of government and kings and queens, well, that's just monarchies. But even then, there's more than one kind of monarchy. Isn't a dictatorship a form of monarchy? Totally different vibe if you're playing within that country. Um, Britain has a parliamentary monarchy, so it's democracy mixed with monarchy. Um, we don't actually directly elect our Prime Minister in this country. Our Queen chooses one. Traditionally, the monarch chooses the person who is the leader of the largest political party and uh, appoints the, the new PM after each election based on, you know, pure numbers from the vote. But that's just a way of staying politically neutral. Behind the scenes, our monarchy is just as politically active as it has ever been. So, what other forms of government are there? And the answer is many, 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 many. Um, you could argue that as well as being a parliamentary monarchy, a democracy and a monarchy, uh, Britain is also a um, plutocracy. Because in order to get elected, you need money for marketing and your campaigns. How do you get that money? Well, you sell your policies. So, you know, to the highest bidder, to, to a vested interest, somebody with money, money who wants you to implement certain policies. It's why in, in the West our political system has always been pretty much supporting vested interests. It's why the, the, every time Britain votes a left-wing government, they get a right-wing one instead. Because vested interests ensure that they always have influence over the process because our free market system ensures that money is required to get elected and we don't fund our politics from central government so we have to have a government that supports the vested interests of those with the money. So you can have a plutocracy and this, this is all just forms of government from Britain but there are others. You can have an intelligentsia. It's one I spoke about recently on a live stream where I, I have a, a civilization. Uh, or a city, really, uh, that's ruled by uh, a council of intellectuals. But the thing is, 
they might not like a certain person becoming an intelligentsia. Yeah, yeah, because after all, how do you become, how do you prove you're intelligent enough to rule? Well, you take an exam that tests multiple, uh, you know, every aspect of your personality and your, your knowledge and, and, and your ability to reason. But what do you do if you are an intelligentsia and you don't want a certain person becoming one, uh, but you do want um, um, Jen's son and uh, Michael's brother? Uh, we want them to pass the exam, um, but uh, 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 Philip's cousin, no, no, definitely not, don't like him, don't like his sort at all. Um, how do we keep him out? But then, So you get your corruption and that's where your vested interests come from. And you can do politics and intrigue around that. But you could have a fascist state. I have a state of fascist dwarves in the campaign setting that I'm using at the moment. So to become a citizen, the populace has to either join the political party, which is the highest form of citizenship, or go through the army. And after you retire, you are a citizen. Um, before then, you have no influence or say or control at all over what the country does. You, are, you don't have the rights of a citizen, but you're still better than the slaves because, of course, fascism needs war in order to su sustain itself. So, you know, slave driving is, is, is obviously a huge part of that. And when you think about different government types, that gives you opportunities to do things, to, to bring in little cultural touches that you don't get if every country is a monarchy. But if you do have a monarchy, try to make it more interesting than just there's an empire here and they've got a ruler and this one has the most food, this one has uh, the most wealth, this one has the most army. Add touches. And uh, I do have in my setting, I have a monarchy. There is a queen and she's a dragon. She's ruled for a thousand years because in my setting, Dragons need gold to live, and as long as they get it, they're happy. Uh, they can keep living forever. Um, so, needless to say, she's uh, conquered the city that is that has the biggest gold mine, and you know wealth is a huge part of the city's economy. But she, you know, she knows she can get the gold that flows out into the city at any point, as long as enough is coming to her to sustain herself. The city will always sustain itself. And um, when eventually the gold mine runs dry, she'll just uh, wander out and take the rest of it that's flowing amongst the populace. So it's a rich city. But she also has a son, who's a dragon too. And he's something of a philanderer. He'll sleep with anything, and I do mean anything. That's his nature. It's how he abuses his power. And as a result, Dragons in my setting are blue-blooded and they can smell other blue bloods. So anyone who has blue blood, they know instantly that they have this blue blood. And it's a pleasing aromatic smell to them. So the offspring of this philandering dragon, they're all blue-blooded. And they like to be around other blue bloods because it's a pleasing smell. So this, this all of a sudden gives us an, a form of aristocracy and it gives us courtship rituals surrounding the aristocracy because you know why why would you marry a commoner they smell disgusting and because of that that then means the legal system is essentially two-tiered because you've got your aristocrats and you've got your common people and um, in this particular case they've made murder a crime for common people it's in the common law it only applies to commoners in this city so uh, that means there is a guild of assassins. It's perfectly public. Everyone knows where it is. It's 182 Blackwater Street on the, the little island of Blackwater. You know, ev everyone knows where it is. It is just common knowledge because nobles can't be prosecuted for murder. But everyone can be prosecuted for the crime of tampering with erosion defences. Why? It's a city of a thousand islands in a fast-flowing river. There are mud banks constantly forming new islands that have been torn apart. Erosion defences are so vital to the survival of the city that everyone is subjected to that law. That then means that the city watch, in this case they're called the Red Watch because they wear red, um, they, are, uh, they, they have a get out of jail free card every time they accidentally kill someone. So imagine how that then influences how the city watch behave. Because, you know, oh, <laughs> you accidentally arrested that person a little bit too hard and now they're dead. Um, let's just drag the body to the erosion defences and say they were tampering. Job done. 
so they've got a free pass. Imagine how that influences the way laws are enforced in the city. So I always find a good way to really give colour and vibrancy to a place is to give it a different form of government and imagine how that would influence the laws of the city. And uh, that's, that's really it, you know, try to break the mould of kings and queens and have some lords and earls and viscounts instead, have private battles, have, have contested castles and contested lands that multiple lords both think that they deserve the right to own because that's where your intrigue comes from. It's not in nation states being at war with each other because that's expensive and no country ever truly benefits from war. No, what, what you want is people with vested interests thinking about what their direct descendants, their children, are going to inherit from them and uh, wanting to make sure they've got a castle for each of their kids, even if that means being a little bit flexible over whether their claim is genuinely true or not. If they've got enough men, then it's as true as it needs to be. So that's it for this week. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Um, this is uh, not a profit-making channel. We did, however, break a record today for the first time we have earned three pounds from advertising this week. Honestly, I wouldn't even put ads on this channel if it wasn't for the fact that it spreads, the, like YouTube promotes the videos more and um, if we've got ads, we get more exposure. So that's why we have them. Uh, it's not to make money, not at three pounds a week. Um, that is not even a beer. Uh, what we do do though is we have a Patreon. So if you find our videos useful, please do consider joining our Patreon account. Um, I'll put the link down below or, or in the thingies that are popping up on screen now. And thank you to the people who do support us on Patreon. Your support means the world to us. It enables to do, us to do all the cool things like have Com Plus Two later this year, where we're gonna raise thousands of pounds for charity. So thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you soon.